Thanks for watching one of our messages today. My name is Caleb Combs and I'm the gathering pastor here at the river and we would love to connect with you. An easy way to do that is text River Connect to 97000 or you can visit our website, theriverchurch.cc for more information. If you'd like to financially contribute and give to the River Church, you can text an amount to 84321 or again, visit our website and click the giving tab. We hope you enjoy the message today. All right, well, let's get to God's word. Acts chapter number 18 and 1 Corinthians 1. Like I said, we're going to kind of uh, ping pong back and forth between those uh, two passages. I am super excited about our summer series. We are going to be looking at the book of 2 Corinthians uh, throughout the course of this summer. And I felt like what was important over this week and next week was really to set the stage, was really to kind of know uh, what is going on, who these people are, where they are, what is life like uh, in Corinth. And so let's pick up in Acts chapter number 18, and we're going to see the story uh, here in God's Word about the starting of this church. Now, if you don't have a Bible, I want to encourage you, you can go online right now, you can download our app, and then we have a tab on there for Bible, and so you can follow along there. Acts chapter number 18, verse number 1, Scripture says, After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. It's about a 50-mile walk. So Paul leaves Athens, and in Athens, he had preached the gospel. And, well, not to be too silly, but he had, there was kind of a meh response to it. Here he is sharing the hope of Jesus Christ, sharing the possibility, right, the opportunity, the gift of forgiveness of sins, the gift of eternal life, and there was really indifference to it. One author talked about the fact that since Paul had arrived in Europe, so in Acts 16, Paul arrives in Europe and starts to preach the gospel, he had been beaten in Philippi, he had been rejected in Thessalonica and in the city of Berea, and then when he got to Athens, people were like, okay, that's cool, anyway. So by the time we reach uh, Acts chapter number 18, Paul is pretty discouraged, Paul is pretty beat up, both emotionally, spiritually, but also physically. He's beat up. He had endured a pretty severe beating uh, in Philippi and had been imprisoned. I mean, some terrible things have happened to him. So in Acts chapter 18, we find Paul discouraged, and he talks about that. Uh, look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. 1 Corinthians chapter number 2, in verse number 3. Paul is writing a letter here to these Christians, these now believers, now followers of Jesus. And he says, I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. Much trembling. Paul says, when I first met you, I, I was afraid. When I first met you, I was weak. I was beat down. I was discouraged. The things that I had felt like God wanted me to do, they, they didn't seem to be working out. So go back to Acts 18. You can kind of see how that um, expressed itself. Down in verse number 6, so Acts 18, 6, Paul's preaching to the Jewish people there. And when they opposed and reviled him. Here he is trying to do what God wants him to do. And he is meeting opposition. People are mocking him. He's trying to do what God wants him to do, and he's feeling discouraged. He's feeling like things are not working out. Like, God, you, you called me to do this. I know you want me to be here, but this does not seem to be going well. And I want you to understand, sometimes we are under a, a false uh, assumption. We have this myth that when God calls us to do something, everything is going to go smoothly, that everything is going to be wonderful, that it's all going to be sunshine and roses and smiles, and everybody's going to be supportive of what we're doing. But sometimes when God calls us to do something, it's going to be difficult. Sometimes there will be days of discouragement. Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he says to the disciples, he says, the servant 
is not greater than the master. Meaning the disciples, guys, you're not greater than me, Jesus, the master. So he says, listen, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. So don't be surprised by that, John would later on write. So Paul is pretty discouraged in Acts 18. But God does some neat things for him. And I want you to see just very practically what he does. Verse 2. The Bible says in Paul, so he found a Jew named Aquila. Uh, Pontius recently from Italy with his wife Priscilla. So these folks would show up a few times throughout the Bible. Later on, they would actually put their life on the line for the Apostle Paul. So they were a great encouragement to him. So Aquila and Priscilla, husband and wife, and they were in Corinth because Claudius, so the Roman emperor, had, com- had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. So they were kicked out of their home. They were kicked out of their town. They were expelled from Rome, from the country of Italy, simply because they were Jews. And so here they are in Corinth, and Paul meets them. Well, somewhere along the way, they get saved. We don't know if they were followers of Jesus when Paul met them, or if they were followers of Jesus after Paul met them. But I want you to see what God does for Paul here. So they start working together. Verse 2. And he went to see them because he, Paul, was of the same trade. He stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. He, Paul, reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade the Jews and Greeks. It didn't seem to be going well. Verse 5, when Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia. So Paul's on a missionary journey here. He's left Athens and he has come to Corinth. Long walk, he's there, he's discouraged, he's alone. But God starts to do something for him. God starts to put a support system together for him with Priscilla and Aquila. And God starts to bring back into the picture a guy named Silas and a guy named Timothy. Silas was Paul's kind of partner in ministry. In Acts 16, they went to prison together. And at midnight, they were singing songs, and God did a miracle and opened the prison gates and saved the jailer. It's a wonderful story there in Acts 16. And Timothy was a young follower of Jesus who was a great supporter and friend and a son in the ministry to Paul. What do we see? When you and I get discouraged doing what God wants us to do, and I guarantee if you're not discouraged right now, that maybe there will come a day Right? There's likely to come a day where you will be discouraged in the future. You need fellow Christians. You need believers. You need someone who loves Jesus, who comes alongside you. You need that community. One of the most important things we talk about here at our church is getting in a growth community. Finding believers that you're spending time with. Believers that are praying for you. One of the most encouraging things anybody ever says to me is, Josh, I'm praying for you. A couple weeks ago, I was uh, uh, preaching in uh, in Waterford, and as these these older folks who've known me since I was a young boy come up to me, Josh, I pray for you every day. And I'm like, oh my goodness, it's so sweet. Just to know that people are praying for me and asking God's blessing on my life and ministry and marriage and my kids, that's a huge deal. So when you're discouraged, sometimes we feel like we want to pull away, right? We want to isolate. Well, I'm going to do this by myself. I need some space. I need some time to think, whatever it might be. But what you need when you get discouraged, you need fellow believers. And so Silas, verse 5, Silas and Timothy arrive. And we know from what Paul would later write, they bring money. They bring a gift from another church. Hey, get this to Paul to support his ministry. So when that happens, verse 5, Paul was occupied with the Word. So Paul is able to stop working a job. He's able to stop making tents to support himself, to put food on the table, to put a roof over his head. He's able now to get really focused on being occupied preaching the Word of God. Verse 5 again. So Paul was occupied with the Word, testifying to the Jews that Christ was, uh, that the Christ was Jesus. And then they opposed him. And reviled him. And he shook out his garments and he said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. He's like, I I tried to warn you. I've tried to share the gospel with you, but you know what? I'm innocent. I'm clean before God. My conscience is clean. 
And he says in verse number six, from now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Meaning, I'm here preaching to the Jews. You know some things about the Bible. You know that the Christ is going to come. I'm trying to tell you that Jesus is the Messiah. He's the one prophesied about in the Old Testament. I'm trying to tell you these things, and you won't listen to me. You know what? I'm done. I'm done pounding my head against this brick wall. I'm going to preach the gospel to the non-Jewish people. Now, who are they? Well, they were the Corinthians. So hold your spot there and go to Romans chapter number 1. Romans chapter number 1. Paul is writing this letter. Sometimes they're called epistles. It really is just a letter. You don't have to be intimidated by that word at all. But Paul is writing the book of Romans, the letter to the Romans, and he's writing it from the city of Corinth. Now, what's he seeing in Corinth? Corinth is an interesting place. Corinth had a unique geographic spot in Greece. If you traveled from the south to the north, you had to go through Corinth. If you traveled from the north to the south, go through Corinth. Corinth sat on this little like, like piece of land that divided these two seas. And what would happen was sailors would literally bring their ships to Corinth, put it on wheels drag it across the land, and then dump it back into the water rather than going around to the south. It would save a ton of time. I think about the logistics of that, right? Rather than keeping the boat in the water, it was easier to pull it out of the water, put it on wheels, drag it across a few miles of land, dump it back in the water, and continue sailing to your your port destination. Well, Corinth was a rebuilt city, meaning it had been destroyed, and then the Roman Empire had rebuilt it, So there wasn't any long-standing families. Uh, You go to any type of family. People, some of you here from Goodrich or uh, Lapeer or Grand Blanc or Davison or or Hadley or whatever you may be or Ortonville. There's certain families that have been there for a long time, maybe for two, three, four generations, and their family owns this, and that's their family farm, and that's their family business, and they own this. Right? There's long-standing families in communities. Well, in Corinth, there wasn't that. It was a hub for business. Travelers are coming through all the time. And so it was an incredible opportunity to make a ton of money. There wasn't all this long-standing people and families. And so it was like, this was an opportunity for an upstart business. This was an upstart a place for a former slave to come and, and make a new life for himself or herself. So there was this huge opportunity there for business. There was also this temple there. And it was a temple where a thousand priests, uh, priestesses worked. So female priests would work. And during the night, they would come down and they were prostitutes. And so Corinth was an incredibly immoral city. Matter of fact, in the Greco-Roman Empire, in the Roman Empire, the word Corinthian became synonymous with sexual immorality, impurity, and really crooked business practices. So it had a bad name. So the town was really crucial, right, from north, south, east to west. It it sat in a very geographic, important spot, but it was incredibly immoral. So when Paul gets there, not only is he discouraged by what happened in Philippi, not only is he discouraged what happened with all these other places, he's discouraged because the religious leaders aren't accepting the gospel, and he's looking around, and what else? He's discouraged because he's seeing an incredibly immoral society. He, he is seeing a society that is base, that, that is wicked and sinful, and it's all around him in Corinth. So Romans chapter 1, in verse number 18, Paul writes this from Corinth. And what is he doing? He's writing this from Corinth, and he's writing about Corinth. He's writing about the society he sees around him. Romans chapter 1, verse number 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. 
For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. Men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips and slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. I just want to say this about this passage. Welcome to America. Right? I don't know how you can't read that and see the connections over and over again. You look down at verse number 29, filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, many of what we see advertised is based upon covetousness. I want what my neighbor has. I deserve what my neighbor has. We live in a world full of murder, violence, strife, gossip. Verse 29, it's praised. Slander is accepted. Pride is praised. Disobedience to parents is just acceptable and normative and somewhat, you know, just presented as comedy. But what you see there in verse 32, Paul says they practice these things and they not only do them, but they demand that everyone give approval to those who practice them. One of the things we're going to look at over the course of this summer that's very troubling, but very applicable, is the fact that what is happening in Corinth that Paul is dealing with is exactly, right, nearly one for one what we as Christians are dealing with in our society. It's a tragedy. It's, it's hard to, to admit that. I don't admit that with any sort of joy or glee. As believers, you're trying to raise your sons and your daughters or love your grandchildren, your nieces or nephews, looking at the way the world is today, wondering how much worse things can get. Romans chapter 1 talks about the fact that that starts with a rejection of God. The true character of God revealed in Scripture. And when we have removed God, when the church has compromised on the true character of God, these are the dominoes that fall. So go back to Acts chapter 18. Paul says, okay, 
the Jewish people won't hear me, the people that know something about the Bible, who are looking for a Messiah. Paul says, all right, from now on I'm going to go to the Gentiles. Now that was a group of people that is described in Romans 1 as what? They've abandoned the worship of God, and they have all these temples, they have all these priests and priestesses that are uh, consumed with immoral activity and drunkenness and uh, debauchery and all these vile things. Paul says, I'm going to take the gospel to them. So that's what he does. Verse 7. And I hope you see the comedy in this verse because it really makes me smile. Paul's like, okay, I'm done coming to the synagogue and doing this. I'm done pounding my head against this wall. I'm taking the gospel to people that, you know, Lord willing will listen. Verse 7. And he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. I love that. You know why I love that? Because Paul didn't cease caring about the people that um, opposed and reviled him in verse 6. He just went next door. Like, I'm done talking to you. I'm out of here. I'm going to talk to these people now. And, And in my mind, I'm thinking, Paul, you're next door to the synagogue. I wonder if he just amped up the volume a little bit, right? Like, I'm going to preach extra loud to you guys so they can overhear, right, what I'm saying. And so he begins to preach there next door and something happens. Verse 8, Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, meaning the head guy next door, the head Jewish guy, he gets saved. Somehow Paul going next door rattled something in him. The Holy Spirit used that. And he believes in the Lord together, the Bible says, with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. So something starts to happen here. Paul is discouraged, but he's staying the course. And all of a sudden, the head Jewish guy gets saved. And now this this guy uh, next door, he's preaching gospel there. And many Corinthians are are being baptized, and and they believe in Jesus. But verse 9 tells us what? Paul's... Paul's still pretty discouraged because what happens? People start to get saved. That draws more attention. And what's that mean for Paul? It means he's likely going to get in trouble. Verse 9, the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you. What comforted Paul was the presence of God. What comforted him was knowing that God was with him. The great promise that I love that Jesus gives to us, he says, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. Go into all the world, preach the gospel, baptizing them, in the name of the Father, Son, the Holy Ghost, and then teach them what I taught you and I will be with you to the end of the age. When everything comes crashing down, I'll still be there with you. It's what God told Joshua in Joshua chapter 1, verse 9. Don't be afraid, be strong, be of good courage. Do what I'm asking you to do because wherever you go, I'm going with you. Paul was encouraged by the presence of God. And then a specific promise there, verse 10. No one will attack you or harm you. Like you're safe here. Right after that, in verse number 12, they, they made a united attack. Verse 12. So Gallio was pro-council right, of Achaia. The Jews made a united attack on Paul. What's Paul thinking? Here we go again, but not. Because God had promised him that he was going to be okay. Sometimes we look at our world and we get discouraged. I don't know about you, I I do as well. I've had people from time to time to say, Pastor, what, what do we do about this? What do we do about that? It's very disheartening when you look around and you see just absolute moral decay all around you. It really is frustrating. And I want to show you what Paul did. And I want to show you what you and I as believers are called to do. So let's turn over to 1 Corinthians 1. Paul's there. He's beat up. He's staying the course. His own 
my countrymen, his own people, the Jews rejected his message, his message from the Lord. He's trying to help them, and they, they ignored him. They mocked him. Then they made an a, a attack on him. They were trying to physically hurt him or get him imprisoned or even get him killed if possible. God's protecting him. But this is what Paul, when he got to Corinth, started to do. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, or excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and verse 1. Paul says, And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. Now he's writing a letter to a group of Christians in Corinth. And he says, When I came to you, I, I proclaimed the testimony of God, but I, I didn't do that with lofty speech or wisdom. This is Greece. Corinth wants to be Athens. By the time Paul gets there, Corinth is more prominent than Athens. But Athens is, is the site of the Parthenon. Athens is the site of all these, these great philosophers and, um, and, and their, their universities and their, and their teaching and all these things. And so to a Greek, knowledge and philosophy and thought and being able to speak well, that was really important. Well, to a Roman, physical presence was really important. There's a second century description of Paul that he was short, bow-legged, bald, and had a big nose. So Paul shows up to a Greco-Roman society he is not coming proclaiming God with lofty speech or wisdom like the Greeks would want him to, nor does he look like a Roman leader or like a Roman uh, you know, uh, Caesar or a Roman general. So he's not filling either one of these roles. But verse 2, so 1 Corinthians 2, 2, Paul says, For I decided, I made a clear decision to know nothing among you. I wasn't going to talk about the, the, the pagan this or, or, or this or that. The, the bullseye, the thing that I had to get to was Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Look back at verse uh, 17 of chapter 1. Christ did not send me to baptize, right? He did baptize a few people. And up there in verse 14, we'll see Crispus' name again. So Crispus got saved. Paul baptized him. Paul says, that wasn't the bullseye of the mission. That wasn't the main thing I was trying to do. Verse 17, but to preach the gospel, not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of his power. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Look at verse number 22. Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. They wanted some long philosophical thing and the Jews wanted some miraculous sign. But what did we do? Verse 23, we preached Christ crucified. Now back to chapter 2, verse 2. I decided it wasn't going to be about lofty speech. It wasn't going to be about philosophy. It wasn't going to be about this sign or wonder or whatever. It was going to be about the proclamation, the faithful preaching of Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Verse 3, Paul says, I was with you in weakness. So I, I couldn't be the philosopher, and I didn't have the physical appearance that you were looking for, but I was there in weakness and fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and in power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, Right Or in the you, you were sold something by men, or you were convinced by men, but it was the power of God. Scripture says here, I didn't want it to rest in the power or the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. If you got a pen, you can jot there in the, the margin of your Bible, Romans chapter one, verse 16. Right before that blistering description of a, a fallen, immoral society. Paul says this in Romans 1.16. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. What did Paul do in the brokenness of Corinth? He proclaimed the gospel. He proclaimed the good news of Jesus Christ. 
Sometimes we look around and we wonder, what do we do? What do we do? Do we join this movement? Do we get involved in this cause or, or this political push or whatever it might be? What do we do? And I, and I hope that you know that I'm not um, blind to those things. The hurt of the world that we see on a grand scale, but also in, in personal things that many of you um, go through on a daily basis. What do you do? And I want you to hear it very clearly and see it from the Apostle Paul's example. You preach the gospel. You preach the gospel. You commit to the good news of Jesus Christ. That's what verse 2 says. For I decided. I'm going to challenge you today to make that decision. Do you know what your children need? They don't need, first and foremost, your political convictions. They need the gospel. Your sons and your daughters and your grandchildren, sorry, they don't need to know how it was in the good old days. They need to know the gospel. They need to hear the power of God, that Christ was sent and he died for sinners like you and me, that Jesus was buried and in great power and authority, he rose from the dead and he offers to every single man, woman, and child on planet earth, he offers to us the forgiveness of our sins and the hope of eternal life. That's the power of God. Now, I know how it works. Some of you are thinking, man, pastor, can I record that so you can just, I can just play that because I can't say it that well. I have people say that stuff to me all the time. Listen, it's not about, look at verse 1, lofty speech or wisdom. Verse 4, it's not about your speech or your message being in plausible words of wisdom. It's about proclaiming the gospel in simple, clear terms. You say, man, I might fumble it. You might, but that's okay. Get up and do it again. Do you know what your coworkers need? They need the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know what your friends in college need? They need the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know what your friends at school, your high school, your middle school, your work, they need the gospel of Jesus Christ. They need to know that God so loved the world that he sent Christ to pay the penalty for their sins. That Jesus triumphantly rose from the dead. That's the gospel. And it's such good news. Here's why. Because it's the only good news. It's the only hope for the world. And what you see is that is what leads to transformation. Corinth was a broken, sinful place. What did Paul come in and do? He did not come in and start addressing this problem and this problem and this problem and that problem. What he came in and he knew what people needed most. He needed, people needed to hear of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what led to transformation. Now, in 1 Corinthians, go over to chapter number 6. 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. We see, years later, because we know Paul spent um, a couple years, it looks like, maybe more, there in Corinth. And now he is writing to them. And he is talking about the people in Corinth that are fallen, the people that don't know Jesus, how they act. Verse 9, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Look at it. You see sexual immorality there. You see adultery there. You're seeing the swindlers, right? Wicked business practices that were commonplace to a Corinthian society. Paul came and he preached the gospel. Verse 11, and this is the important phrase. Paul says, and such were some of you. You were these things. This is what your life was defined by. But you were washed and you were sanctified and you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. What transforms a broken, morally bankrupt society 
is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what transforms people's life. We've talked about it many times over the last weeks, right? It's Christ in you and me, the hope of glory. People see that. Yet the church has gotten bogged down with all of these other things. You're sitting in here, we all come from different backgrounds. Watching online, we come from different places. Come from different religious backgrounds. Some of you uh, come from a, a Baptist background. And I know, I watch you try to lift your hands and there's some sort of Baptist limit. You cannot put your fingers above your shoulder. It's just, it's just a thing. It's okay, don't worry, I love you. All right, we got some folks who come from a more charismatic Pentecostal background and your arms just go up straight every time it's time to sing. It's just the way it rolls with you. There's nothing wrong with that and I'm not mocking it. It's great, right? We lift holy hands to the Lord. Some of you come from Methodist background or a Nazarene background or a Presbyterian background. Some of you come from a more Reformed tradition. We come from all different backgrounds. Guess what? We don't agree on everything. We don't. There'll be things that I say today, you go, I don't agree with that. That's okay. That's, it's okay to disagree about some things. What we don't disagree about is the gospel. What we can't disagree about is the gospel. That Jesus came and he was born of a virgin. That Jesus lived a sinless life. That he was the Lamb of God sent to take away the sins of the world. Jesus laid down his life as a perfect substitute for you and I, the sinner. The sinless dying for the sinner. He who knew no sin becoming sin, the Bible says, so we could become the righteousness of God. That Jesus rose from the dead. That Jesus is returning. These are things that we can agree on. And that's what unites us is the gospel of Jesus Christ. But so many Christians fall into the trap of let's, let's find something to disagree about. I love my wife. She's legitimately the most wonderful person I know. She's, she's incredible. Loves Jesus, and because she loves Jesus, she can love me. And she's a great person and a great wife and an amazing mother, just a wonderful person to be around. She and I don't agree about everything. I find out later I'm wrong, but uh, right, we, we don't agree about everything, but we still love each other. We have five kids. We don't agree with how to parent all the time. Guess what? We're never going to agree about everything. There's going to be songs played up here you don't like. Okay. Right? Some of you may be like, oh, why is there lights? Or, oh, I like the lights. Or, why are they on a stage? Or, why is there drums? Or, why is there guitar? That was too loud. Or, that was too soft. Or, why are there plants on the stage? Right? Like, it's all this stuff. It, it, we get bogged down with all these things rather than saying, hey, you know what is overarching over all of that? It's our love for Jesus and the fact that he has transformed us. He's changing us. So can I tell you what the world needs today? The Corinth that we're living in? It needs believers to commit to the gospel. Decide to know nothing but the gospel. Making sure that we're not getting bogged down in all these other peripheral conversations. But the gospel is the supreme thing. It's the, it's the bullseye. It's the goal. It's what's the first thing to come out of our mouth. It's the first thing we want people to know. It's the death and resurrection of Jesus that offers them the forgiveness of their sins and the hope of eternal life. Maybe you're sitting here today and you know Jesus, but you've gotten bogged down in other things. I want to I challenge you to decide today to make a commitment to the gospel. Maybe you're sitting here and you don't know Jesus. Maybe you came for a baptism or a friend or you're watching online, whatever your story may be. Maybe you need to know the Lord. The Bible simply says in Romans 10, 9, 
If you'll confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. What begins is a transformation then. Maybe you're here with your wife. Maybe you're here with your husband. Maybe you're here with your parents, whatever brought you in the door. The truth is God loves you. He sent Christ to die for you on the cross. He offers to you the forgiveness of your sins, a pardon. Not because God ignores sins, but because Jesus paid for sin. And he made a way for you to escape the righteous judgment of God. If you'll call out to God, the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So whatever background you come from, maybe you're churchy or this is the first time You've been in the door the first time you've ever clicked and watched online. You can be saved. Let's pray together.